Welcome to Strip Cover Lit, where we wrangle the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort, and we are here today for a video which will take place in three separate playlists here on Strip Cover Lit. Number one, of course, being the short story playlist, a short story review, as we are here for. Uh, number two, being Into the Tall Grass with him. Uh, this is the second story in the Hemingway collection. Uh, the Finca Vigia edition, by the way, if you still need to grab that. And at number three, this is a video for the Dirty 30, a series of videos on Strip Cover Lit, 30 videos in 30 days where we celebrate crossing 3,000 subscribers on the channel. So, um, what are we doing here? We are doing a short story review, uh, which will be a recap of the story, three good things, three bad things, quotes, literary analysis, ratings, and recommendation from the text by Hemingway. This short story is the Capital of the World um, by Ernest Hemingway, the second short story, like I said, in the collection. So, what happens? Uh, Paco and his sisters have moved to Madrid from a small village where all three work in the service industry uh, and enjoy the small perks of living in the big city. Paco, in particular, as he idolizes, idolizes the toreros of the bullfighting spectacles. Late one night after everyone has gone home, Paco and the office prick Enrique get into it, as Paco pantomimes the actions of a torero. Enrique says that Paco would chicken out in the situation, ever being in a ring with a bull. Paco says, nah uh how would you know? And Enrique says, because that's what I did. Well, after that, the obvious step is to tie knives to a chair uh, and see if Paco is as Torero as he Torero says. And Paco stands in there, sure, but he gets bored, gored. Paco stands in there and gets gored by a bull seat. And he bleeds out before Enrique returns with help. So three good things about this short story. One, uh, this is a great example of how to write characters at conflict without creating any bad guys. There are not, I don't believe, any two characters in this short story which actually get along except for the two relatively anonymous sisters that moved to Madrid with Paco. Um, even then, there is no quote-unquote bad guy. Number two. This is a fantastic execution of making a reader feel cloistered within a single cell inside one of a larger body, inside the larger body that is the capital of the world. We get this sense that Madrid is a very real and very happening place. But all we're ever really exposed to is this one little hotel. Number three, Hemingway does so much with characters that appear so little in this text that it is difficult not to feel like you've been through the entire day of work with Paco. Three bad things. One, this story is 60% over before anyone takes control. That is, before this can be said to be anyone's story, it's already over half done. Number two, I think if we got a touch more of those anonymous sisters and a little bit less of the waiters at the beginning of the story, we'd really feel as if we had more skin in the game. So that by the time the end comes around, um, I think that it would hit a little harder. But even then, I mean, it's hard to fault Hemingway for that because, sure, you could add more with the sisters and make it a longer story, or you could take some of the waiters out um, and put some of the sisters in and keep it the same length, but then you lose some of that feeling of this being such a big place with so much going on. And number three, on the bad things, if you're not paying close attention, I think it would be easy for this short story to fall into also ran category um, and to that lower status of middling Hemingway. Uh, the first time I read this collection, all I knew about this short story after having finished the collection and looking back over the titles was that this came 
after Macomber and before Kilimanjaro. That was all I really remembered about it. So moving on to quotes from the piece, I've picked just these three. Decorum and dignity rank above courage as the virtues most highly prized in Spain. Down in the dining room, the tallest of the waiters, who was overdue at a meeting, said, Look at those black pigs drink. That's no way to speak, said the second waiter. They are decent clients. They do not drink too much. For me, it is a good way to speak, said the tall one. There are two curses of Spain, the bulls and the priests. Certainly not the individual bull and the individual priest, said the second waiter. Yes, said the tall waiter. Only through the individual can you attack the class. It is necessary to kill the individual bull and the individual priest. All of them. Then there are no more. Save it for the meeting, said the other waiter. As the doctor from the first aid station came up the stairs accompanied by a policeman who held on to Enrique by the arm, the two sisters of Paco were still in the moving picture palace of the Grand Via, where they were intensely disappointed by the Garbo film, which showed the great star and miserable low surroundings when they had been accustomed to see her surrounded by great luxury and brilliance. The audience disliked the film thoroughly and were protesting by whistling and stamping their feet. All the other people from the hotel were doing almost what they had been doing when the accident happened, except that the two priests had finished their devotions and were preparing for sleep, and the gray-haired picador had moved his drink over to the table with the two house-worn prostitutes. A little later he went out of the cafe with one of them. It was the one for whom the matador, who had lost his nerve, had been buying drinks. The boy Paco had never known about any of this, nor about what all these people would be doing on the next day, and on other days to come. He had no idea how they really lived, nor how they ended. He did not even realize they ended. He died, as the Spanish phrase has it, full of illusions. He had not had time in his life to lose any of them, nor even at the end to complete an act of contrition. He had not even had the time to be disappointed in the Garbo picture, which disappointed all Madrid for a week. So, for literary analysis, the crux of what I'm going to be talking about here could probably accurately be boiled down to the necessity of the authentic man. The authentic man, of course, being a trope in Hemingway that we discussed a little bit in the last video, which was The Short Happy Life of Francis Macomber. Um, but it's, it's a, I mean, it's self-explanatory. The authentic man is necessary. The authentic man uh, is the good man. The authentic man is the strong man. The, the authentic man is the necessary man. Um, you get outside of that and you're, you're not a whole man. You're not a real man. So um, I think that if we're going down that road again, um, this is the interpretation to go with as far as the reading is here. And it is based on one interesting turn of language which appears on page 36. And it is as such. The woman who owned the Luarca was already asleep in her bed, where she lay on her back with the bolster between her legs. Big, fat, honest, clean, easygoing, very religious, and never having ceased to miss or pray daily for her husband, dead, now twenty years. Skip one sentence forward. Now, in the deserted dining room, Enrique tied the last knot in the napkins that bound the knives to the chair legs and lifted the chair. Now remember, this is the chair that ends up stabbing Paco, um, and he bleeds out from it, because he had been pantomiming the toreros. The first quote uh, about the woman 
who owned the Lawarica was already asleep in her bed, where she lay on her back with a bolster between her legs. This could easily be something so simple as a lonely person clinging to a pillow so that she has something with which to cuddle. Uh, after all, she is missing her husband, and that is very telling in this situation. Missing her husband. But let's look a little closer here um, to note that she's already asleep. Passed out, perhaps? It is also awkwardish to cuddle a pillow while you're on your back. Also, also, awkward to cuddle a pillow between your legs a little bit, I think. Um... But perhaps most telling is what type of pillow it is that Hemingway gives to us in this situation. Uh, what type of pillow it is that is being utilized. And that is a bolster. A woman as proper as she who runs the Luarca is someone who is going to have fixed their bed before laying down. Uh, so a bolster would have been buried under other pillows to bolster them up. Um, but this woman's relationship to this bolster pillow necessitated that she dig it out. This is her special pillow. This is the one that she uses to cuddle between her legs. Um, this is a scene of masturbation. That's slick, that's sly, and that's subversive. But let's look closer yet. We move forward to that second quote, which happens just a sentence after we're told about her laying on her back with the bolster between her legs. And that sentence is as such. Now, in the deserted dining room, Enrique tied the last knot in the napkins that bound the knives to the chair legs and lifted the chair. On fixed blade knives, such as this, uh, the thick piece of metal between the blade and the handle. The piece of metal between my hands right there, if you can see that. Uh, what this does is it strengthens the knife as a whole. It helps keep the icky stuff away from your fingers. It helps keep the icky stuff away from your fingers. And it gives the knife a nice place to stop upon insertion. Think about those things. I'm not going to go further with that. Um, this little piece of metal right here is called a bolster. That is what you would use if you were going to, so say you're putting this on a chair. You're going to put it right up to it, to the bolster, and you're going to tie the knot that way. So that is also known as a bolster. Um, so what's happening here is we're getting this woman using a bolster in the absence of a real man for sexual pleasure. Young Paco was pantomiming the real authentic men, the toreros. Um, and because he cannot do that, he is using these knives in place of the bull inserting them to the bolster. This act becomes deadly. Because Paco is not the authentic man. He is not the real man. He's not the macho man, right? He cannot handle a bull. He can't even handle a bull seat. So there is a little bit of symbolism going on there. Um, and if we're playing with these two ideas, uh, though masturbation is commonly called playing with yourself, it needn't be done alone, is this commentary that these two young men engaged in pantomime as if they are playing with themselves, they're masturbating together. Something fairly subversive. Um, but let's dig a little deeper, yes? The Lady Luarca, she is masturbating in the absence of a real man, literally. In the world of Hemingway, few men are more authentic than the Torero. So, Paco pretending to be a Torero, pretending to be the Torero, is deadly enough in itself that this act cannot be escaped. 
if you are not the authentic man. Just the playing with yourself as if you were a real man is deadly. That's how deadly the world of the man is. And of course, Enrique in this situation ends up getting himself in trouble, having stabbed Paco. That's why at the end he returns in the hands of the police officer, because he has already confessed to not being man enough, but he took his shot in the bullring and lost. Having survived that, he's at least authentic enough to get through this. Um, some other small notes from the text, because I think that is the main literary thrust that we're going to go with here. Um, and I said previously in one of my other short story reviews, uh, the one for T.C. Boyle that was uh, earlier in this month, or is that to come yet? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm filming these in advance, so I don't know if that's already dropped or if that's going to drop. Anyway, I try to present quotes on their own, and I had presented those quotes that I presented earlier in the video on their own, but most of those quotes tie directly to uh, something else that is interesting in this story. So we're going to go into a little bit of analysis here as well. This, coming on page 31, the final pair, the penultimate paragraph in page on page 31, and spilling over on to page 32. Down in the dining room, the tallest of the waiters, who was overdue at, a, at the meeting, said, Look at those black pigs drink. There's, that's no way to speak, said the second waiter. They are decent clients. They do not drink too much. For me, it is a good way to speak, said the tall one. There are the two curses of Spain, the bulls and the priests. Certainly not the individual bull and the individual priest, said the second waiter. Yes, said the tall waiter. Only through the individual can you attack the class. It is necessary to kill the individual bull and the individual priest, all of them. Then there are no more. Save it for the meeting, said the other waiter. And what I love about this is that at first, this looks like terrible dialogue. No one speaks this way. No one talks like that. And it looks that way until you get to the end. Save it for the meeting. Once you get that little line of dialogue, you know what kind of meeting it is, you know what kind of person the first uh, waiter is, and you know that, yes, there are, in fact, people that speak like this. Um, and it's just one of those little things that Hemingway is able to do to put something small in there that looks terrible at first, looks like bad writing. And then you get to the payoff, and you realize you knew all along. This bit at the end about the... Here we go. The two sisters of Paco were still in the moving picture palace in the Gran Via, where they were intensely disappointed in the Garbo film, which showed a great star in miserable, low surroundings. When they had been accustomed to see her surrounded by great luxury and brilliance. That's this story. That's Paco. Paco's playing, just like their favorite actress is playing a part in a movie. And they did not want to see her in such lowly surroundings. Paco dies alone, bleeding out on the floor. Um, Paco moved to Madrid as, a, as the star of his own story, and died in a pool of blood on a kitchen floor. Take that punch, gut. So that is, before the sisters even get out of the movie, this calamity has, has, has befallen them. Um, and then the bit about decorum and dignity. Decorum and dignity rank above courage as the virtues most highly prized in Spain. The first quote that, that we had there, so much is made of the way that the men in the bullfighting industry and the men who used to be in the bullfighting industry 
and the men who are past their prime in the bullfighting industry but still appear in this short story look. So much is made of the way they look. So much time and description is spent there. Why? Because they still dress immaculately. They've, they've taken the time every morning to make themselves up in that way. Not for utility, though. Not for utility. Um, why might they still dress that way and present themselves in this manner? Perhaps to bolster their status? To give them a fall, like the bolster pillow. You put it under the other pillows to make them look bigger. So, finally, a rating and a recommendation for this text. This text being The Capital of the World by Ernest Hemingway. Um, the rating, I didn't use to like this short story. Uh, I thought it was sort of throwaway in the canon. But this reread proved very fruitful for me in spending a little bit more time with the text to dig deeper. So I give this story 85 bolsters out of 100. As far as a recommendation, if you like, if you like this brand of punch in the gut, um, I think that you would very much enjoy Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been by Joyce Carol Oates, because both stories have disillusionment, danger, denigration, disenchantment, and a dab of the diabolical. So if you like this sort of thing, do me a favor and hit that like button. If you are here for the first time and you have not already subscribed, this is the sort of thing I like to do. It's the sort of thing I hope you'll be seeing more of on the channel. So go ahead and hit the subscribe button if you have not already. Um, and if you would like to help me create more content here on Strip Cover Lit, there is, as always, a link to be found in the description below to my Patreon. And I hope to see you for the snows of Kilimanjaro, as it appears next in the complete short stories of Ernest Hemingway, the Finca Vigia edition. Um, and I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Or a lot of literary fun. Or another really big kick in the gut because that short story is heavy. Don't tell me he's going to turn off during that.